don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop. Keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are. darkness, my God, that is who you are. Everybody, thank you for joining us for our online service today at Connection Church Dublin. We just wanted to take a minute and let you guys know that we want to make sure that connecting with you is as easy as possible. Um, we're going to have links in the comment box below to our website, ConnectionDublin.com, also to our Facebook page, our YouTube channel, and our app. So you can go to the comment box below and check those out. Um, I want to give a little encouragement. Um, that yeah, I know there's a lot of things going on in the world right now, and we just have to remember that no matter what, our God is who He says He is. Um, Jesus Christ is still our Savior. The book of Hebrews, chapter 13 it says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Um, and we just have to remember that no matter what's going on, that God still loves us. And like the book of Romans says, he's still working all things out for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. I just wanted to encourage you guys with that and let you know that we're praying for you. Um, we love you. And if there's anything we can do, please reach out to us on any one of those places that I've mentioned before. Um, we're gonna play a, be a short video now for our um, all of our Connection kids. We hope you guys enjoy it. Thank you. Hey Connection Church, my name is Cohen. Um, these are the videos that we have prepared for you. I can't wait to see y'all all soon again. I will touch him. were on a boat and then there was a storm and then the disciples were scared and then um Jesus was um sleeping and they went and woke up Jesus and um Jesus told the storm to stop and it stopped and Jesus told um the disciples to have faith in him. Bus fear by knowing. We trust Jesus. When do you trust Jesus? Fear Busters. Who are you gonna call? Uh, hello. Yeah, th uh, this is Bigfoot. I I think you got the wrong number. Well, good morning again to Connection Dublin. I'm gonna invite you to sing along with us. I 
Let the King of my heart be the flower and sun my veins, the echo of my days. Oh, He is my soul. You are good. You're good. Whoa. You are good. You're good. Whoa. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. Ever be on 
on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips. Good morning, Connection Church. My name is Peyton. Uh, as we head into this time of giving, I just wanted to share some scripture with everyone. This comes out of Romans 12, verses 12 and 13. It says, Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer, share with God's people who are in need, practice hospitality. And so in this season that we're going through, I just want to share these verses as encouragement. Um, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer, and uh, share with God's people who are in need. Let's take care of each other. Uh, let's continue to do that. Continue to take care of uh, those around us. Continue to take care of our community. If you would like to give to our church, um, you can do it online at ConnectionDublin.com. You can text a dollar amount to 84321, or you can mail your offering to 124 South Monroe Street, Dublin, Georgia, 31021. Thankful for everybody. Continue to pray in this season and hope everybody's staying safe. We love y'all. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, Buck here. Welcome to Connection Church uh, Dublin. Thank you so much uh, for streaming this service as we dive into week seven uh, of our series, Living Hope. So if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, uh, you can go ahead and open up to uh, 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, we're going to be in verses uh, 12 through 19. And so if I could uh, kind of reintroduce this series, what we've been doing is walking through uh, the book of 1 Peter. And what this book is all about uh, is it's a letter from Peter, one of the apostles, uh, written to a group of scattered churches uh, that are undergoing suffering and persecution, or I'm sorry, about to go under uh, suffering and persecution. And so uh, obviously uh, we can draw some parallels to the things we're going through, even though it's not necessarily uh, persecution, uh, all of us are under some form of difficulty uh, in response to uh, this COVID-19 uh, situation. And so real quickly, just want to let you know, uh, man, we are praying for you. Uh, we are praying for uh, our community, our church, our nation, uh, but we're believing that God is doing something in the midst of this. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, that today. And so if you will, go ahead and open up to uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, uh, verses 12 through 19. I'll read them and pray, and then we'll hop right in. So it says this. It says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when, the glory is re when His glory is revealed." If you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you're blessed. For the, spirit of the, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us... What will, be, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Let's pray uh, and let's jump into this. God, we love you so much. God, thank you for today. Um, God, I'm just asking right now, uh, that you would just use this text to speak, God. Lord, as, uh, God, as I, I've, I just lean into you in this time, God, I just pray that you would uh, just have me be a humble vessel, uh, God, that I would be obedient to your word and God, your word would speak. And so God, who, regardless of who's listening or, or what the situation is, God, I pray that they know how much you love them and God, that you uh, desire to be in relationship uh, with people. God, thank you for sending your son Jesus. And God, I just pray right now over this message, Lord, that you would use it uh, in a powerful way. God, I need you. Uh, Lord, I'm leaning into you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. And so um, today we're going to be talking about uh, suffering and suffering for being a Christian. Okay. And so if 
if I had to say in, in all the, uh, I guess in all the conversations I've had with people that are, are skeptical, maybe skeptical about uh, the idea of a God or skeptical about Christianity, um, usually what you're going to get to is the question, um, is God really good? And if God's good, why do bad things happen to good people? Or, or why does he allow uh, bad things to happen? Okay, And so it's the, the age-old question that really all of us at some point or another, uh, we have to face it and we look at this question, right? And so why? Why is there uh, suffering in the world? Or maybe you've heard this question before or, or heard this statement. I, I just don't believe in a God that would allow that. There's something bad that would happen. I just don't believe that. And so we're in the midst of a, a global pandemic, okay? And you guys know this, right? Like this is a, a, a disease, a virus uh, that, that we do not have a vaccine yet. And, and it is affecting the globe. People all around the world are coming face to face uh, with this thing they can't control. Now, I want to tell you something interesting. And this is why I believe God is doing something in the midst of this. We serve a, a God who is sovereign, uh, who is in control. And again, I, I want to speak to you skeptic because I want to tell you I've been a uh, skeptic before, but as I've grown in my faith, I, I've just grown in the assurance of who God is because I've seen what he's done around me and in my life. But I do want to appeal to you today uh, and to listen to this. This is what I think is super interesting right, is in the midst of this virus, instead of people retracting, um, we've seen all the statistics on Google, uh, the word prayer and God has doubled. That we're seeing all across the world, uh, people searching, searching for prayer, searching for God. And I think that's super interesting that in this trial that's affecting everyone, it seems that people are looking instead of retracting. And so that's why I say I want to encourage the church for a second. That's why I say the world stands watched and this is the, the world stands at watch and this is a time for us uh, to really give them the message. Okay. That's why I believe God is in the middle of this doing something for the good of those that love him, but also to reach people. That's why I believe God's uh, at work, okay? And so maybe it's this. If anything, I think it's brought all people to a sense of our own helplessness, that we aren't in control, that we uh, do not have control. I mean, in a matter of weeks, um, our, our normal routine has been thrown off and we are forced to look at a, a new normal. And that we understand our helplessness to be in control, okay? And so when people are desperate and have no hope, uh, we all will begin to search for it. And so I want to encourage you. I believe God is doing something uh, really incredible in the midst of this situation. And so today, um, we're going to talk about uh, suffering. And what I want to tell you is this. I believe one of my most important responsibilities uh, as a leader, a church leader, uh, is to give people an, app an appropriate theology uh, on suffering. What a theology is, what you believe about God as it relates, um, in this case, to suffering. And I believe that's one of the most important things I can do uh, is to talk about, man, suffering and, and how does it fit in. Right? Like, why, why do, does difficult things happen? Why do people get sick? Well, why do these things happen? Because many of us uh, have been affected by this, right? And so I want to talk about this today. And so I'm going to go. I'm not going to throw you guys off. I'm sure some of you are like, you type A people. I've been preaching texts backwards and doing all these things. I promise you, this is your week, okay? I'm going to start in verse 12, and I'm just going to preach the text, okay? So uh, you're welcome. So take out your notes. Um, take this down. First of all, suffering may be a sign that you're doing something right. Hear that again. Suffering might be a sign that you're doing something right. And I want to explain this, okay? So starting in verse 12, um, let's read this. It says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, okay? As much as, as though something strange uh, were happening to you. Okay, so um, he, he's saying you should not be surprised when things get tight or things get difficult or we go through uh, a trial, right? It shouldn't surprise us, okay? If I could give you an example, um, 
talking about gold, okay, I want to talk about gold for a second, okay? So if you go back all the way in, in, uh, in chapter one, I believe it says that we are being refined like fire. So remember, he's talking to a group of people. He is preparing them for a difficult situation, and he's talking about um, them being refined, okay, and being refined as to, to become gold, all right? And so um, I, I was studying a little bit about this, and First of all, gold, and many of us right now are thinking about like a gold, like a gold block or maybe um, a, a ring or something like that. But what I want you to know is this. Gold in its original state is super ugly, right? Like it's just a, a rock. And I was looking at some of the things. I was like, man, that's hideous. It's just like a rock with a couple of little like, like yellow looking pieces attached to it. And it's just, it's just pretty useless looking. It's not attractive in any way. It's not really, it doesn't look very much worth um, anything, okay? It's not attractive. It's hard. It seems useless, okay? But what happens is uh, when that rock is taken and it's chipped away and the, the minerals are found and what happens when to make gold soft and moldable where we can make it something attractive, something more pure, what happens is that gold has to be heated up and refined. In fact, it has to be heated up to like a thousand degrees Celsius. In fact, it says that um, a refiner's work is a very dangerous work because of the intense heat that it takes to produce this beautiful substance, right? And so the same thing happens with us. Before we come to faith in Christ, all of us, right? Like we are not an attractive, uh, we are not an attractive thing to a perfect, holy, good God, right? Like all of us struggle with sin. All of us, uh, before we come to faith in Christ, have a, a hard heart, one that's not attractive. Maybe some of you, um, you, you think back to sins you've done or maybe sins um, you're walking in and you know, like, man, I, that is not good. Like, God is not pleased with that. I look back at my own life and, and some of the stuff I've done and I'm like, man, what an ugly, ugly thing to do, to treat people that way to cheat people, to, to talk that way, to, to put people down, to belittle people, and, and all these sorts of things. It's just an ugly, an ugly thing. But God takes that ugly piece of nothingness, that hardened heart, that, that life that, that it, it just looks like there's no use of it. There's no godly use for it. And what he begins to do is he takes that and he begins to refine it. He begins to take that hardened, ugly exterior and he begins to work in it. And that's what refining is, okay? And so God uses trials and sufferings uh, to change us, to, to make us into something awesome, something beautiful that is infinitely valuable to the world and to himself from an ugly piece of stone, right? And so God's at work in the midst of suffering. Now check out verse 13 with me. It says this, it says, but rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory uh, is revealed. And so second thing, take this down. Suffering points us to our Savior. Hear that again. Suffering points us to our Savior, okay? And so here's the deal. Um, Christ isn't good. I, this is one of my favorite quotes. Um, Christ isn't good until... Uh, sin's bitter, right? In fact, the quote goes like this, until sin is bitter, Christ won't be sweet. If we don't understand what he saved us from, we will not cherish the one who saved us, right? And so um, here's the deal. Uh, when, when we come to faith in Christ, he becomes our prize. And so I was thinking about uh, this. Um, how many of you guys remember uh, that Odell Beckham catch, right? You, you guys remember, if you're not a sports fan, you may be totally tuned out. I promise I'll come back to you. But for, for those that do watch Sports Center and are absolutely fiending for an athletic event, those that are looking for rugby at 2 a.m., um, I got a little something for you. Like, so Odell Beckham makes this crazy catch, man. Like, he's falling away. He catches the football with one hand. And then all of a sudden, um, we all go to football practice, and every kid on the team is trying to catch a ball like Odell Beckham. They're imitating him for this great, miraculous catch that he's done. They began to imitate him. 
And then his jersey sales go through the roof. And so people begin to imitate him based on this awesome thing that he's done. They want to be like him. Same thing. Michael Jordan hadn't played basketball in 20 years or so. And we continue, maybe not that long, but we continue to buy his shoes. Why? We want to imitate him. We want to be like him for his greatness because of the great things he had done. Well, here's the deal. In the same way, when we understand what Christ has done for us, because see, Christ did the greatest thing this world has ever seen. Christ died in the place of sinners who didn't deserve it to rescue them from a life of sin, to rescue them from a life that was headed to death to a relationship with God that will last for eternity. And so when we know what Christ has done for us, he becomes our prize and we want to imitate him. That means we want to become like him. We want to know him. We want to know who it is that saved our soul from death to life. That we have a living hope. Even when this world gets dark and suffering comes, we know who we are in Christ. So therefore, we should become imitators of Christ. And so when we suffer, hear this, when we suffer for whether it be choosing to be a Christian, whether you've lost friends or, you know, the people pick on you at work or, or whatever that may be, um, you know, we're imitating Christ. Like we, we, we are suffering the same way he did, right? When we go through difficulty, choosing not to cheat on taxes when everyone else is, we are choosing to follow Jesus. We are choosing um, to, to imitate him, to be like him, okay? And so suffering points us to our Savior. It reminds us that when we suffer, maybe we're doing something right because Christ suffered for us. Therefore, we should be imitators of him. Another thing I've learned about suffering is this. Would you guys agree, when, when are you most dependent on God? I want, I want everyone to think about this. When life's just cruising along, man, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you, you, you're cashing the check on Friday. Um, everything's pretty well set at home. Uh, you, you, you know, we're, we're kind of just rolling along, just cruising, man. All the restaurants are open. If you're a food, uh, you're a food guy like me, you know, like, I love sitting down in a good restaurant. And, and, and when life's going really well, um, wouldn't you agree that that's when we become more independent of God? Like, well, we just, we've got it. We don't really need them because things are set. Like, we're, we're good to go, man. I, I don't really need God. But here's the deal. Suffering, okay? Suffering makes us realize our dependence on God, our need for Him. We pray when things get tight, right? When we realize our own hopelessness to control the outcome, then we become dependent on God, which is what God ultimately wants is for us uh, to be in relationship uh, with him, okay? And see, we, we, we then are driven to prayer and we, we just realize our need for him. And so suffering points us uh, back to God. I, I'll tell you guys this, man. Um, I, even in my own suffering, walking through uh, some spiritual battles, some mental, uh, some, some mental difficulties, some, some mental illness stuff, and walking through uh, intense suffering like I've never felt uh, in my life. I want to tell you is this, um, suffering makes us lean in. When there is no hope, right? When we're hopeless, we look up. We look to the God of heaven looking for our hope. You know, the Bible says he is where our hope comes from. This series is about a living hope and what happens when the fiery trials come, when difficulty happens, when we lose the job, when a family member gets sick, when things get tight, then we take our gaze from what's going on around us to heaven where our hope is. And we say, God, I need you. You are where my hope comes from. And I realize I can do nothing without you. And so suffering Suffering makes us look to the heavens. Next, suffering. Suffering should assure us that we're in Christ, okay? Again, remember, it may be that you're doing something right. Don't be like me. When I feel like things are getting difficult, I, I like to think, God, what did I do wrong, right? And the thing is, we may not be doing anything wrong. He may be doing, uh, it, we may be doing everything right. Tim Keller had a great quote on suffering. He said this. He said, one of the main ways we move from abstract knowledge about God 
to a personal encounter with him as a living reality is through the furnace of affliction. Hear that one more time. That is good. One of the main ways we move from um, uh, a person, uh, we move from an abstract knowledge about God to a personal encounter with Him as a living reality is through the furnace of affliction. What that means is God does not become a, a He is not a moralist, abstract thought, a place to go for an hour, a set of rules to try and obey. No, he is a personal God who wants to walk in the furnace of affliction with his people. Why? Because he loves us and he gave his own son for us so that he could walk alongside us as we go through the furnace of affliction. And so we suffer. When we suffer, we're participating uh, with Christ and God is with us us, right? And he becomes personal. Why? Because we realize how much we need him. And again, like I talked about last week, when we walk through suffering, that's when we begin to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Because God, the suffering I'm walking through does not compare with what you have for me, which is eternal life with you. And so it gives us perspective. Remember, following Christ is all about perspective, seeing the big picture, okay? That we trade in the immediate to get the ultimate, which is God, which is heaven, okay? And like I said last week, we get to a place where we don't know what we would do without them. We've leaned into them so much. We've been through the fires and the trials of life, and we've stuck with Jesus, then now we don't know where else we would go. Why? Because we've been tested, and we're faithful. We're with Christ, okay? And so I want to challenge you with this. What has Christ, what has following Christ cost you? What, what have you gone through that's difficult and chose to say yes to Christ? Because it's very clear God is doing something in the midst of this. That, that we should not be surprised when trials come because uh, they're a part of the process. And so I want to, to think about that. Think about, man, what does it look like as I've chosen Christ? What have I given up and what am I gaining? And how often do I think about it where I'm going, right? Think about it. Third thing, let's read verse 14. It says this, it says, if you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you, okay? So it says this, it says that what? When we suffer, okay? When we suffer, we should be counted blessed because the spirit of God rests on us. Third thing, write this down. Suffering makes us grateful for our Savior. Uh, Suffering makes us grateful for for our Savior. Okay, Hebrews 12. I want to read a passage with you real quick. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. This is what it says. It says, uh, therefore, this is an encouragement to the church. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of faith. Now, hear this, okay? So it says to fix our eyes on Jesus. Remember, he's our prize, um, that that we imitate Christ. We want to be like him. Now, listen to how Jesus did it, okay? This is awesome. It says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary, and you will not lose heart. It says that Jesus walked through suffering. In fact, he went all the way to the cross. Why? It was the joy set before him. There was such clarity about the why of what he was doing. He endured because there was clarity of the calling. And you talk about suffering, man. Um, Jesus Christ formed creation. The Bible says that he's the living, the spoken word. He's the living word of God. Um, All things were created by him, through him, and for him. And so the one who created, right, left heaven to come be with us and let his creation uh, pierce him with many transgressions, hang him on a cross and kill him. And he stayed there. Why? For the joy set before him, he endured much opposition from sinners. He endured the cross for us. And so our suffering reminds us of what Christ suffered for us. It makes us more joyous for a Savior, right? It makes us more joyous for a Savior. The fourth thing I want you to see in this, verse 15. Um, Let me go back to our text. 1 Peter, um, 
this is what it says. First Peter, let's look in verse 15. It says this. It says, if you should suffer, uh, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even as uh, a, meddler, a meddler. Fourth thing, uh, make sure you're suffering correctly, okay? <laughs> make sure you're suffering uh, correctly. Um, it's kind of like this. <clears throat> if, if you're playing with fire, Right? If you're playing with fire, and I know some of you pyros, man, my, my, the other day we were, um, we were lighting up the charcoal. And, and so uh, uh, my, my father has a flamethrower, literally like one of those flamethrowers like you'd see in a movie or something. And he lights that charcoal and like burns it up really fast. It's the most awesome thing. I, I feel super powerful when I hold that sucker and uh, just get to, to use a flamethrower. It's really awesome. Um, but here's the deal. Uh, playing with fire is dangerous, right? And so if you're playing with fire and you get burned, what's not wise is to blame the person that said, hey, this is fire and it's dangerous, right? And so what that means is if we are not living a life with God, if we are not following God, if we are living in sin, when God says, man, this is clearly going to harm you, when we are harmed and we suffer because of our bad decisions, right? We don't blame the one that said, don't do it right? It's just the opposite. Make sure when we suffer, we're suffering correctly. And that when we, when we decide to go our own way, I want to tell you, man, that is a dangerous road. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And I want to tell you, it's a breeding ground when we decide to go and live our own life the way we want to live it. When we decide to want to have the marriage uh, the way we want to do it or raise kids the way we want to do it. No, that's when we're playing um, with fire, Right? And that's our own sin that causes pain and suffering, not God. That's our own sin. But here's the crazy part about it. Okay, I want you guys to check this out. This is how God uses suffering. A lot of times in our own sin and rebellion, we suffer so much that God uses it to draw us to himself. Okay, Even when we walk in our own sin and we suffer, right? God uses that uh, to point us to something better. I I'll say this. I, I went through a phase in my life. I got saved at 21, um, began to lead some Bible studies and, and really watched God do some, some really awesome stuff. I was very young in my faith, very zealous. And man, I, I took a couple years and I just let off the gas pedal and I just kind of wanted to do life the way I wanted to do it. I began to... Uh, to just take some concessions in some areas and say, ah, oh, it's not, not important. I'll, I'll kind of do it my way. I didn't have guardrails up of, of kind of the, the way God instructed, said, man, this is where life is to live life this way. And I want to tell you, I got burned badly. Okay? I got burned badly. On the other side of this, I, I, I found a marriage that was in bad shape, right? I, I found a, a ton of things that went wrong. But in the midst of that, it drew me back to say, man, I don't want to suffer this way. I don't want to suffer without purpose. But man, there's got to be a better way of doing life than this. And maybe some of you, man, maybe you struggle with alcohol all your life. Maybe some of you, man, you are just addicted uh, to sexual sin, whatever that looks like. Maybe some of you, man, it's drugs, whatever it may be. Eventually, we suffer enough where we come to the point is there has to be something better than what I'm doing. And so suffering sometimes draws us to a better answer. And what that answer is, is a relationship with God. We realize that we need help. We need help. We need a shepherd that I've tried to do it my way for this long, God. I've come up empty. I've caused nothing but pain to myself and the ones around me. And God, I need you. I need a shepherd. I need someone to help me. I want to tell you, just like I said last week, when we come to the end of ourself, when we finally suffered enough in our own sin, okay, that's the point where we say, God, I lay this life down and I choose you. And I want to tell you, whether you be 20 years old or whether you're 60 years old, whether you're 80 years old, it's never too late. It's never too late to say, Jesus, I've been doing it all wrong. I need you. And God and his sovereignty meets us where we are. And so suffering can work incredible things for God. It can draw people to himself, right? There's a better way to do it. Now, verse 18, let's continue to read. So it says this. It says, 
All right, let's start in verse 17. It says, For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will, out, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Next thing, write this down, fifth thing. Uh, walking with God is joyfully difficult. Hear that again. Walking with God is joyfully difficult. And so you're saying, well, those two things um, don't really go together. What, what does that mean? Okay, I want to read something, a passage real quick. Matthew seven fourteen says this. It says, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. Okay, well, what that means is, is, the pathway, remember we were talking about suffering by doing it our own way. The pathway, uh, the pathway to sin and death is broad and wide. And remember, like I talked about last week, I acknowledge it. Like we all, man, we wake up and we have the tendency to just choose us, to do it our way, to follow sin and self, to just do it the way we want to do it, right? Like we all struggle with that and we all have that tendency to go that way. But it says, there is the way and few find it. So what that means is there's nothing more joyful, and I'll argue this to anyone, there's nothing more joyful than doing life in a relationship with God. But make no mistake, it is not easy. It is difficult. It is joyful, but it is difficult, right? Like, and I get it. I get it. I, I get the draw to say, man, I, I don't know if I can give this up to get that. And, and this is just so different than my lifestyle. And what will my friends think? What will people think if I really was all in? Like, I don't want to become the weird guy, right? Like the, the weird Bible guy. Right, And I, I don't, I don't want to give all this up to get this, but what I want to tell you, this is coming from the guy that went this way, and when I heard the gospel and it got my heart, I went this way. This way is worth it. Not only in heaven, but it's worth it now, today. Because I have security and purpose of what I'm here to do, what my, my set reason for being is, and I know whether tomorrow I wake up or tomorrow I don't, there is clarity about what's coming. That I know without the shadow of a doubt that I'll be with my Savior. When my last breath comes, I'll be with Him. So I want to tell you He's better. He's worth it. What will be is far greater than what we are now. Hear that again. What we will be is far greater than what we are now. What we'll get is far better than what we have here. Hear that again. What we get will be far better than anything we have here. Because here's the deal. Without God, right? The best we have uh, to look forward to is only the sin and self we can gain here. We cannot take it with us. So the best we have to hope for is what we can find here on this earth. And I want to tell you, it pales in comparison to what we get, where we're going, who we're going to be, what it's going to look like. We're going to get resurrected bodies. We're going to have uh, a, a joyful experience with God for forever. But see, here's the deal. Suffering is a part of that process. Difficulty, trial is a part of that process. And so, hear this quote. Fire, when it comes, talking about the fiery trial, when difficulty and suffering comes. Fire consumes straw, but it purifies gold. Hear that again. Fire consumes straw, but it purifies gold. And so we have to ask ourselves, how solid is that foundation my life's built on? Because if it's built on just me and self, how I want to do it, man, when the trials come, man, we're going to fall and it's going to burn up, right? When the suffering comes. But man, when we go through trials as believers, okay, hear this. When we go through trials as believers, we're being refined into something beautiful, into gold, something that's precious in God's sight. And we are achieving this. We are achieving that salvation that God has already given us in Christ. And it's a part of the process. We know it's necessary. We become not surprised at it. And we know what it's producing. A beautiful, a beautiful instrument for God's glory. So we understand the process. And then lastly, uh, I want to read verse 19. It says, So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator 
and continue to do good. I, I love this. I love this passage so much. Okay, you guys, you guys with me here? I, I'm I'm struggling preaching to this camera, so I, I just want to. I want to talk to you in your living rooms, on your phones, wherever you are. Man, I wish I could see you. I pray you're tracking with me here because I want to speak some encouragement to you in the middle of this coronavirus, all right? I want you to lock in with me. Hear this from from me, okay? God has a plan. God is in control. God is not caught off guard. God is working this thing out for his glory. He's got a plan and he's trustworthy. I want to tell you, man, if you go to Connection Church or not, I just want to speak into your life. Man, we, God loves you. He's got a plan for you, okay? He's got a plan. Terry Timboom said it like this. And I want to encourage you, whether you're struggling with fear, worry, anxiety, what, what is all this going to look like? Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. Hear that again. Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. It is clear who he is. It is clear what he's done. It is clear what promises he has for those who love him. Namely, Romans 8, 28, all things work together for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And what I want to tell you is this, and this is why I want to tell you when times get tough, when we are squeezed as in this season, Know this, your faithfulness in suffering points others to Jesus. Hear that again. Suffering points others to Jesus. The world is dying to see a hope that's real. Okay, when we're Cadillacing and we're 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 not stretched, man. That you know it is what it is. But man, when we all experience difficulty, loss of a loved one, loss of a job, um, um, some sort of of difficulty, struggle, how we respond is what the world takes eye of, and they say, how does he have hope and joy when he's going through what he's going through? Okay, how does he do it? And it points others to Jesus. And so I want to I want to I want to pump you up with this. Okay, I want you to hear this. Tim Keller said it like this: Only when our greatest love is God, a love that we cannot lose even in death, we can face all things with peace. And so what, what essentially he's saying is, I want to encourage you. Um, I want to encourage you uh, is this: When we love God supremely, okay no matter death or anything else, we can face everything with peace because we know we're at peace with him and we know what's coming. I've got two things. One, one of the, one of the, uh, one of the pastors I really glean a lot from, his name's Matt Chandler. He pastors a a church in Texas. And, and what drew me to Matt Chandler out of the, the, the dozens of preachers I could have listened to. Okay. Cause I, I'd really, Man, I had really gotten on fire for the Lord and was just hungry to learn, hungry to grow, hungry to listen and just just gain knowledge, gain insight. I wanted to know more about this God that was doing this work in my life. And so what drew me to Matt Chandler um, is a guy, young guy, I think at the time, he, he was maybe in his 30s. He had um, took a church, I think with 168 people, and it had grown to several thousand in like a, a few years. Just a, a ferocious man of the Lord. Loves Jesus, loves the gospel. Growing church, loves his wife well, loves his family. Um, comes into the kitchen one day, passes out on the floor, goes to the doctor, massive tumor uh, on his head, uh, large chance he's not going to make it, right? And so I'll tell you the long and the short of the story. The long story, the, 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 the end product is uh, he went to the Lord in prayer. People around the world play, prayed for him. He miraculously came through the surgery uh, and is actually still preaching today. But I want to tell you, if you want to be encouraged, go and listen to his sermons while the tumor's in his head, knowing that he may be at the last of his days And he faithfully preached Jesus and said, man, God is good today. And man, I I just drew to that. And I said, man, that's real. Whatever he believes in, whatever he's he's got, I need that. I, I need to know that. And I was drawn, why? Because of the hope he had and the faith he had in Christ in the midst of suffering. Right? And I want to tell you, it is, it is, uh, to, to quote a good friend of mine, he said, when we walk through the valleys of life, okay, 
Just know there's good soul in those valleys. And sometimes in those valleys, God's doing his best work. Sometimes in the valleys of our life is when God's doing the best work in us and God's preparing us uh, to reach more people through what we've gone through. Right? And I've experienced this in my own life that many times when we walk through the season of suffering, there's a divine purpose. And in those valleys, God is doing his best work. And then lastly, I want to speak about a good friend of mine. I say that. There, there was a, a lady, um, Carly and I, we were, we were young. Shoot, I think we were 24, 25. And uh, we got asked to lead a Sunday school class, a single Sunday school class. Um, yeah, I, th- to be honest with you, uh, I'd only read one book of the Bible all the way through the book of Romans. So we just started studying Romans. because That's really all I knew what to do. So I, I just did it. And so there was a young lady who started coming. Um, her, her name was uh, Audrey, Audrey Cook at that time, Audrey Calibro, as many of you know her, and uh, just the, the sweetest lady. And man, I, I remember thinking like, I'm so ill-equipped to teach a Sunday school with her. She should be teaching me. I mean, just love Jesus uh, emphatically. I mean, just radiated love and, and just, just a, a, a beautiful human being, just, a, a, just an awesome, awesome young lady. In her life, man, she was... Uh, she had been through a, a, a very difficult relationship. Um, she had had a lung transplant, ton of, of medical issues, and just the most joyful person. Even when I talk about her, like I think about, man, what, what, a, what a picture of someone pointing to God, right? And she went on, oh, man, I want to tell you, she met an awesome guy, a guy named Kevin. They got married um, just a uh, just two fantastic people that I'm thankful that I've had the chance uh, to know. And, um, and unfortunately, like I said, Audrey had a ton of health issues and she's gone on to be with the Lord. But I'll never forget at her funeral, um, one of the pastors was reading and talking about some of her journal entries. And basically what she said is she felt confirmation that um, it was God's purpose for her to walk through this. And that it was her opportunity, hear these words, it was her opportunity. It was her opportunity to share Christ with the world through what she had suffered. And she was at peace. She had the, I believe they even said this, it is well. It is well. And I want to tell you, man, I want to speak about her because that, that is what the world's looking for. That's what the world needs to see is a hope in Christ in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of suffering that points to him that there is something they're seeing. There is something that person's seeing that's greater than anything this world has to offer. And so I want to encourage you with that today. And I want to tell you, in the midst of this, remember, God's got a plan, okay? He's in control, and he's going to work all things out for his good. So ask yourself the question, What is God doing with me in the midst of this trial? What is God doing with me in the midst of this COVID crisis? Maybe for some of you, if you know, man, I don't have a relationship with Jesus. That narrow way, I don't know it. Broad is the way, that's my direction, Buck. I want to tell you right now in your seat, Jesus Christ has died in your place. There's nothing you can do to earn his forgiveness. There's nothing you can do to earn his salvation. It's been paid for. And what God says is this, if you'll confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and repent in your heart and believe that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so I want to give you a second, man, to think about that. And if that's where you are, go ahead and do that. Let us know, and uh, we would love to follow up with you with some information. For the rest of us, man, I love you so much. I can't wait till we get back together. And I pray you have a blessing. Love you guys more than you know.